Richard Krause. Thank you, thank you. Good times with with this flick. This was uh, came along at the certainly at the right time, and uh, I think I think it is what it is because I wanted it to, I needed it to be something to come along at the right time. You know, you just you do something. Arts are weird. You do it. You start it because you're passionate about. It. I mean, I guess some cats start it because they want pussy or money. But I started because I was like, to make a movie to tell a story, that'd be fucking cool. And I, you know, whether you like those movies or not, they're made with fucking absolute passion. None of them were ever phoned in. So you do that for as long as I did it, and you just empty the tank. And after a certain point, you're like, okay, what's left? Formalism. Like, I mean. I am a director now. This is what I do. So even if I don't have a story to tell, which is weird because I'm a writer-director, so I'm, I'm mostly kind of a screenplay driven. Even if I don't have a story to do, like, that was it. That's my gig, and you can't alter that or change that, you know. And, and then I started thinking, like, well, yeah, I can. I could just stop. Like, there's no reason to not to, to keep going if you don't want to continue. And But it's a tough thing to walk away from because it's the dream job where somebody's like, we'll pay you to make pretend. And if you're like, that's great, thank you, I'm done, and I'd like to try something else, you just feel like a shit. You feel like, you know, fucking you won the lottery and then threw the money away. But I, I think that's why a lot of us or filmmakers kind of get trapped and, and wind up with diminishing returns because it's just a hard party to leave because you realize how fucking, you know, it's like that line that Jack Nicholson has in terms of endearment where he's just like, there's only fucking 80 astronauts in the world. I'm fucking one of them. You know, it's like very few of you ever get through that fucking gate to start making movies. or And if you do, the, to make one that impacts at all, you know, it's just like it's constant hill climbing. And once you get to the top of the hill, which it doesn't even have to be like, you know, 100 million grosser, it's impacting. It's being known. It's having your work known. It's you know, having a style like, you know oddly enough Tim Burton and I are in a same category and as much as like feel, there's an unmistakable look feel to a Tim Burton film and there's an unmistakable look and feel to what I do you know it's just the, to, to, to become signature is kind of sweet because it just means that at a certain point you're you know you're like Woody Allen your work just speaks for, not necessarily speaks for itself because I always get out there and talk about it afterwards but it just it, it you you can strip the credits out and know your work. And that's what kind of red state for me. I was just like, well, let me see if I can make a movie where if you strip the credits out, you wouldn't know whose fucking flick it was. Or you would think it was somebody way better than me. You know, and that was kind of that was kind of the aim was like, well, let me try that. Let me try to make a movie that, like, I love watching but never would try to make. I make Kevin Smith movies. Like, it's in my DNA. It's in my genetics. I can't avoid that. And I like it. But... I knew that I was going to be stopping, and I was just like, you know, before you leave, while you still have enough fucking pull where people give a shit, see if you can make one that's not you, you know? And, and I started it kind of back on Cop Out, and, you know, I took a lot of shit for that movie, but I was very happy because it wasn't me. Like, it's not a Kev's, Kevin Smith film. Even Jersey Girl, which is outside the VSQ universe, is very much me. Cop Out's not, and that was a very important flick to make so I could make the jump to Red State, because I think it would have been way weird if I went from Zack and Mary to Red State, and I think uh, the Cop Out was a necessary step, and I think it was a necessary step just artistically, which is weird to say for Cop Out, but Cop Out created that kind of relationship rift with me and, and critics and for, for a period, for a long period actually, where it just kind of changed my mind about the whole thing because I was just like, wow, some of these reviews aren't even reviews. They're just kind of it's blood sports. People trying to be clever and shit like that. And it's, a, yeah, yeah, and, it's and it's like, and which I'm like, hey man, I, nobody understands that more than me, but that's an unfair playing field. And so after they went after Cobb, I particularly harsh. And again, it wasn't even like, I didn't write Cop Out, so I didn't have that part of me invested in it, where it's just like, whatever you say about it slays me to my soul. Like, I was the director, you know, the steward of the flick. But still, I felt like somebody that had kind of raised a special needs kid, and that kid was getting bullied in the schoolyard, where they were just being made fun of uh, for the way the kid speaks or whatever. It just, it was sick. It didn't seem like film criticism. It was just fucking blood in the water. So at that point, I, you know, for years and years, I'd been that guy constantly uh, deferred to respected the critical world because that's how I was brought in the people that you know I first dealt with when I got into the film business 
we're just like critics. You'll always need critics because they're the bridge between your work and the audience and blah, blah, blah. And, and so it was very, it was, you know, I was introduced into this animal farm system of all animals are created equal and some animals more equal than others and stuff, which I never quite understood. And, and, and I don't deal with people the way that most people deal with press. I have a way, I, you know, I'm an over fucking giver and stuff like that. And I'll do the simple like, hey, this is, this is my schedule or this is what I worked on. You know, I just start pouring out and sharing. And you do that for years and years with people and you start to think you have relationships with them. And then all of a sudden they're talking about your work in a way where you're like, what the fuck? We're friends. Why would you write that? Like, I got to deal with enough of that shit out there in the world. And then you realize we're not friends. Like, you know, it's you have a different perspective of the whole thing and whatnot. And so that all that years of that and coupled with what was going on with cop out, I was like, I want to, I want to try something. And I went after critics and I went after critics and I criticized critics and the most amazing thing happened. They got more upset than I ever did. It was crazy. Because they live in a little, like, nobody ever goes after the critics. And I know, I'm, you know, I'm, I've, I make my living writing about movies. I've been in I, there too. Yeah, and, and, and I do it, I mean, I write historically about movies. I'm writing right. a book about a Ken Russell film from 40 years ago right now. Like, so, you know, I'm well, not, it's, you're not the enemy. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not, it's not all new stuff, but it is a lot of that too. Right. So, you know, got to pay the mortgage, yeah, right? Totally. But we're not used to having people come back at us. Yeah. And that's the kind of interesting thing. And that was, that was amazing to me, was watching people go doing it yeah when you were doing it i was following it all interestingly and i wasn't disagreeing with it because i do think that um there's a reason why critics don't have the same kind of that clout they that they used to uh when clerks 20 years ago when clerks mm. came out and and the critics sort of you know pushed you up mm. to another level um i don't know that that happens anymore because there's too many so there were 50 names then yeah. 50 names that could impact or push you up think about it like that, that's mind bending yeah. when you think about like fifth, let's say fifty critics. Yeah. Period. And if if you're being generous, yeah, yeah, yeah. tops a hundred. Yeah. It ain't the way anymore. Yeah. Now go to Rotten Tomatoes and see. Okay, here are your official critics. Yeah. Here are your unofficial web critics, and here's everybody else. Yeah. Web, it just web democratized everything, yeah. and made something as simple as giving your opinion about something like art put it in everybody's hands suddenly you can write your own blog and it looks like a newspaper and shit like that but i came of age in the world where it was just like 50 people that you got to cover and they can make or break you that relationship changes over time when it's just like when when there are no longer 50 people there are hundreds if not thousands and you can't hit them all. Not all of them know you, and a lot of them are reductive and dismissive. They're not doing film criticism. People are just doing dates of movies coming out. Everyone wants to be first. Everyone wants to get a story out there first. Like I was saying before, man, Red State ended. First screening at Sundance. Within 15 minutes, someone had a review up. It is impossible to digest a film in 15 minutes. Any film, let alone fucking Red State. You know what I'm saying? Like Red State, I'm not saying it's brilliant, but it... It's it's different. You really have to sit there and be like, Jesus Christ, what happened? Well, I always say, if you're going to write a, a film review, you write it within 24 hours because that's your gut, that's or you deal. wait 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but most people don't think like you, sadly. And I get it. Everyone's got a deadline to keep. But, yeah. but that was important. Actually, that moment of going back at them, you know, you have to face your f- fears and your demons. And that was one that I lived with for a long time. Like, not saying it was anybody's fault. It was just the mindset of, like, you would think about a critical audience before you think about the audience. And that, for me, I couldn't do that anymore. I'm like, the audience is the audience is the audience. And so once I kind of cut those ties where I was like, well, you guys keep telling me I'm bad at my job, but I think you're bad at your job, and they got fucking out of sorts, then I was like, oh, you're nothing but a pack of cards. Like, you know, you, you, if I, I, I cut you and you bleed. So... You know the fucking game. There's a dude, a journalist at fucking Ropa Silicon the other day, two weeks ago. I was on, you know, I got a, we do this podcast, internet radio. I'm doing a morning radio show on our website. And I was talking about reading an article, and it was ridiculous because it was like, the, the guy was like, I haven't seen the trailer, but I'm posting it. And then reviewed the trailer, even though I hadn't seen it. I don't get that. Yeah. Mind-boggling. And he also said, like, I made a huge mistake in the first fucking paragraph of the first sentence. So I called him out on and shit like that, and I was just like, this is terrible. This dude is terrible at his job because the, the one fact he got up front wrong was like, how do you get that wrong? Right. The dude sent me an email, and he's like, you know, I was really hurtful when you said that. And I'm like, it hurts to be publicly criticized, doesn't it? And 
point taken. Like, you know, so, but there is that. The other part of it was like, once you free yourself, once you're like, I'm not afraid anymore, I don't care, I don't care what they say. Because there's always an element of like, well, I can't go at a critic because then the fucking next movie they'll destroy. But that was part of it with this. I was like, you know what? Think about it. Flip the equation and go like this. If you go after every critic, they're all suspect no matter what they say, good or bad. So if they write a bad review of the movie, be like, well, of course they wrote a bad review. I just told them his job was fucking pointless six months ago. And that insulates you in a weird way. Like, it not, it, it doesn't insulate you from the world, but it kind of, I guess insulates not the word. I guess what it does is just kind of makes you fearless. Like it was going to Sundance, going up there and saying the things I did, like right before that happened, like I had a weird kind of mini throwdown with Harvey Weinstein where I told him to shut up because he was talking during the movie. Like little things like that, you have to kind of face all the, th the fears because that's where good art comes from. When you're, when you're not, when you're, there's no fear when you're not scared. You're not afraid of the repercussions. There's no repercussions when you're not thinking about your next film, when you're not thinking about like, oh my God, if I do this, I'll never get a good review from this person ever again. None of that. Once you get rid of all that, then your art gets to a cool, dangerous place. Like, I'm not going to say, like, oh, the shit I did in the middle wasn't good. I love everything I've ever made. But you look at my entire body of work, you can see when the artist is at work, and you can see when the artist is in residence. And I didn't want to be in residence anymore. Like, I'd earned it, I know, and I love Chairman Emeritus status. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want to... I don't want tenure. I want to be doing, making, and shit like that. You know, I, I like getting my hands dirty, and Red State was exactly that. Like, Cop Out was an important part of, like, I'm not doing Kevin Smith anymore. Red State was, a, like, the promise. To me, it delivered on the promise of Cop Out, which, again, is weird to say, because Cop Out is a very easily dismissed uh, superficial comedy. But for me, it was, and I think that's another reason I bristled so much people attacked it. I was like, you don't get it, like, without this movie. We don't get to the next two, and the next two are so fucking important and stuff. Richard Krause.